Yes, Mr. Sanders. Um, <coughs> my lords, if I may, I, I got, just before the short adjournment was addressing you on, as it were, the consequences of um, this, if, if, if my lords are with me on the appeal. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I turn just to address the proposition that we were already precluded before trial commenced of running an argument that runs that relates to individual uh, characteristics of PCT. So I need to take my lords to the judge's ruling at the PTR, which my lord was asking about. Um, can I, just before we get to that, can I remind you of the chronology, which we, I've touched on before. So in January 2018, this Justice Roth decided to order the PTR. Um, <clears throat> the wording of that order didn't preclude, didn't decide the point one way or the other. It didn't preclude us from running. When you P say PTR, you mean the preliminary I'm sorry, I'm, my lord, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, the preliminary issues, there are too yeah. many acronyms, I'm sorry. Um, Where's the order from that? Uh, that I'm not sure you have in the bundles, um, but we can hand on a copy if I can think to suggest that. It, um, I'm sorry, my lord. We've got a judgment from it, have we? There's no judgment, uh, there's no judgment from it, I, yeah. I think so. Yeah. But so we, we can, the, yes, of course, exactly I can. The order then, because there's then a huge gap, isn't there? Uh, yes, so there's then a bit of, well, then there's the kind of incremental, then we get to the CMC in January in 2019, where yeah. I showed you the skeleton argument of Miss Bacon. Um, well, that's uh, where Miss Bacon, as you then, was trying to persuade the judge to reverse what he decided previously. Yes. Yeah, well, 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 and success. Actually, well, and said that actually, the, the highlighted that this was going to be something of a sort of um, factual factual soup, essentially, that was the point that I think she was developing in the skeleton argument, because once the knockout points have been dropped, the, the sort of estoppel point which my, uh, which my lord identified a moment ago, yeah. then there were no kind of brick walls in the way of the, the, the factual assessment on a PCT by PCT basis, and then the question was, what is the utility of the, the preliminary issue trial in that form, um, where, and that, that was the point which Miss Bacon was making. In the, in the paragraph of the skeleton I took you to. Was there a judgment on that? Um, that, so I, I know that that wasn't successful for obvious reasons that we're here, but um, I <laughs> may have to, well, we'll have to find, see if because we can. Because of one, one possible answer to that point, I don't know, but one possible answer to that the point that she was making was, well, no, that, that if the preliminary issue is decided in a particular way, then none of that. Uh, factual investigation is is necessary. No, uh, well, my lord, I think there is there is a judgment in following that 2018, 2019. Uh, sorry, 2019 CMC, but um, uh, that I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's in the bundle and what isn't. But it certainly wasn't defined in a way that precluded the individual mm. assessment. That, that's the, the critical point. But if it would assist my lord, we can make a little pack of that, that material because I think if we want to look through. All these points developed from the judge's perspective, what the orders were and what the judgments were, and I'm sure I can liaise with my own friends on the other side and get those to you in a chronological set or three. Um, well, so, so <coughs> there, there was no, just to wind back to January 2018, when the preliminary issues trial was, was yeah. ordered, there's nothing in the order there that precluded us from running this argument, and I'll show you in a second that's recited later on. Um, there was no decision that sampling was unworkable or that we should never receive the disclosure. That was put on hold. What happened was the court took a different tack um, and went down the route of the preliminary issues. Um, 2019, you've seen Miss, Miss Bacon's skeleton. Then we had the expert evidence, which I've already shown my lords. Um, that set out, Miss Kerr set out various minimum steps that she said needed to be done. Um, and I've taken my lords through that earlier on. Um, there was no application to exclude that evidence, but the issue did come to the head in the PTR, and I need to show you how the judge looked at that in, in a second. What happened prior to the PTR was that in an annex to our skeleton argument for the PTR, we summarised the steps that Miss Kerr, in her evidence that had been served, said needed to be done. And at that point, the claimants did object, because they said that's not within the scope of your pleading. <coughs> Some of those steps are not within the scope of the things that you set out in the paragraph, in the, in the relevant paragraph. And then there's the PTR ruling, which if I may, I'll just take my lords to now. So for that, we need the authorities bundled tab, so the 
authority is bundle 4, tab 18. So this was, um, and you'll see the uh, just the. I mean, I'll just take my lords through this, so you can see what was live and, and how it arose. So uh, the judge starts on the first paragraph by identifying the initial of the PTR that the grace is extremely late. Um, second, the amended defence sets out at paragraph eighty-three C part of what's been called the mitigation argument. So those were the paragraphs I took you to earlier on, which included. For example, there's the thing about the local formularies and so on. Um, and the allegation the claimant should take all reasonable steps to encourage switching <coughs> continues in particular, but without limitation, the claimant should have. And then there are seven subparagraphs identifying particular steps. Um, it was on that basis that a preliminary issue was ordered in the following terms. Was it unreasonable for either of the present three sets of claimants or the previous relevant predecessor organisations, including PCTs and SHAs, I'm just pausing there, um, to fail to take any, and if so, which of the steps set out in A3C, or, or, or all the further information that was identified there. Um, the reason for having the preliminary issues was to, in large part, to avoid what would have been a hugely elaborate and expensive disclosure exercise. Paragraph 4. Uh, paragraph 5. Well, the judge seems to be saying there, I mean, he goes on, it was recognised that this would be dealt with by looking at the claimant's conduct on a more general basis. So he was clearly contemplating by ordering the preliminary issue, this was all going to be dealt with on a general basis, not uh, or avoiding the need for elaborate disclosure. Well, certainly the, the, the basis on which the preliminary issue was ordered was in order to avoid the need for detailed and elaborate disclosure. Um, the, there is nothing in the, you see the, 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 the terms of the order, it, it's descends to the detail of the PCTs and SHAs, and it, obviously the pleading, which my lord has already seen, deals with the position of local, local actions in respect of some of those, for example, the local formularies. Um, yeah. the, 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 and then, so then the judge goes on. What subsequently happened is the party's respective experts um, <coughs> are free to consider various aspects of conduct, which I have to say go seems to me to go beyond the scope of the steps in paragraph 83C. So essentially this was Miss Kerr's evidence, um, and uh, you'll see there 6 and 7. Um, so you, some, some of the, the minimum steps that Miss Kerr had identified um, are, are, are um, so some of the minimum steps which Miss Kerr had identified went beyond what we had pleaded, and the judge says it had to say it, it does seem to me to go beyond that, so he wasn't attracted by that. Um, <coughs> Senate PTR, over page 9, claims were projected. Uh, and then paragraph, so then it just recites how the, the question developed, which was obviously at the last minute. Paragraph 11, what confronts the court is now what to do with it. Um, it is quite clear to me the trial would take place as a trial of the issue as ordered, i.e. the thing in paragraph 3. <coughs> Um, had, there has been no application to make a further amendment to the defence, so we're stuck with the 83C on, on its proper construction. Um, any such application would have to be considered, and I think it's the only basis of the scope of the preliminary issue could change. What does then one make of the annex? Uh, that reflects what's said by the experts, which is helpful, but their evidence has to, of course, be related to the issues to be tried. Insofar as they go beyond the issues, it's not of particular assistance. Mr. Turner then invites well, it says that he's taking a practical view of things, which is always, uh, when the council says that one has to be sometimes a little bit careful, but um, it, 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 the, the, um, it says it may be helpful if I comment on some of the points. So the judge then goes on to talk about the extent to which some of the things, the detail of some of the things, was not consistent with what we pleaded. So this is comparing Miss Kerr, uh, her minimum steps, to the detail of the particular steps. Over the page 17, he orders us to give some further information. Um, and five and six, it seems to me that these come within the scope of what is broadly set. So he gives a ruling on how, how to interpret the pleading in the light of these minimum steps, and then there's no objection to some of the others. As regards paragraph 13, <coughs> it's clear to me the preliminary issue is looking at the conduct of the claimants across the board and is not concerned with the conduct of particular PCTs, 
even if evidence from PCTs has been served as illustrative. Now, uh, then he goes on, the whole point, as I said, of the preliminary issue was to avoid disclosure at this local level. And it doesn't seem to me that these sorts of allegations are going to be ones that will form part of the judgment. <coughs> However, I am not excluding any of the evidence that Ms. Kerr has given. There is, as I understand, evidence from particular PCTs, and that will be considered in the confines of the preliminary issue that's been ordered on the pleading as it stands. Therefore, I don't see any reason to give any further specific ruling on what was only the annex to a skeleton argument. Um, now, so the position is that Mr. Justice Roth decided at the PTR that the preliminary issue trial was looking across the board. That is obviously true, we would say, because he'd only had evidence, and there was only evidence in respect of three individual PCTs. He couldn't possibly have looked at anything with any more specificity than that. But beyond that ruling there on the scope of the case that you see in paragraph 21 22, there was no order following on from this, as he suggests in 22, which confines the scope of the preliminary issue he previously ordered in a particular way, or one that, um, that, that uh, it, it was simply that the matters were to be assessed on the basis of the pleadings as they stood, and insofar as the experts had gone off a little bit broader, we were stuck with what we pleaded. Um, so uh, and that the order itself uh, required us to give the further information that you see there at 17. Uh, but what there isn't is an order that, scout, that, that modifies or clarifies the scope of the preliminary issue beyond that that was already referred to in paragraph 3. Yep. And there was nothing for us to appeal at that point. And had there been an order constricting things at that point, that would have effectively operated as a, a sort of a strikeout on parts of our defence or a clarification of defence. And um, there would have been something for us to have appealed at that point, but there wasn't because there was no order. So the, what we say is the, the decision that actually operatively prevented us from making this argument is the one we are now appealing from in the judgment. It's the, the paragraphs, those three critical paragraphs that I took you to earlier on, where the judge approaches this question and says, well, and also the one that you see in the judge's uh, decision on permission to appeal, where he says, you know, you, you didn't, Serbia, you didn't do identify your 40% criteria in over two years or whatever else, and so you're shut out. That is the operative decision. It's not suggested anyway this is in some way read to Carter against us. It's a decision that was made in that judgment following the evidence at trial. And the final point, just to make on this one, Lords, is that it doesn't answer a point that we make under the first ground, which is that the court could have given an answer across the board in the way that was envisaged there in 21 and 22 of that judgment, um, which was informed by the evidence the judge had heard. The two are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, those PCTs for whom, for, for whom Corindrapil made up a high proportion of their budget um, would have, the judge may have concluded, would have needed to take certain steps. For example, put something in their local formulary. That was squarely within our pleading but could have been assessed at a, a, across the board. That needn't have required the position of individual PCTs to be investigated, which couldn't be done absent disclosure. What it does do is shake out something to be investigated and in due course, something that could have been looked at in respect of the particular PCTs where there was very high spending. If you think of as whether alluded earlier on to the map, the hotspot of per perindrifle spending, one zeroes in on the kind of red PCTs where they're spending a lot of money on perindra bill, it may well be that actually on inquiry um, that the same kind of exercise should be carried out in respect of those individual PCTs which it would follow make up a significant chunk of the damages that are being claimed against my client. So that is what we say about the, the, the um, PTR briefing. It doesn't resolve this, I'm afraid, one way or the other. In this. Um, my Lord, so those are our submissions on the first ground. Yeah. Um, unless my Lord have anything further to ask, I have a question, so I'll come back to you after my learned friend. Um, no. If I may, I'll hand over to Mr. Pitchin, then, who, who can address the audience. Um, I'm afraid if we, if we may, we'll just swap seats, which I think yeah, is the easiest way of Take your time.
Hello. Uh, I would like to start, if I may, with a road map to my submissions, uh, which are on grounds two and three. Yeah. Both of which concern the judge's findings on questions A and B, in contrast to, to question C, which mm -hmm. my friend Mr. Saunders has been addressing you on. And my, my appeals, uh, my, those two grounds, are uh, only in relation to two groups of patients. <coughs> One is uh, those being treated prophylactically <coughs> because they're at risk of MACE, which is um, uh, cardiac events, um, major adverse cardiac events. And the other group of patients is those who are recovering from stroke, mm -hmm. so being treated uh, to prevent a, a recurrence of stroke. So my, my roadmap is as follows. I'm going to start by showing you the question that the judge was answering and the answer that he gave. Then I'm going to show you, by reference to our written closings at trial, the case that we were putting to the judge, including the unanimous expert evidence on which we relied. Then I'm going to show you the judge's reasoning and explain why we say it provides no answer to the case that we put. And then finally, I'll just sweep up some points that are made by the claimants okay. in their skeleton. So if we can start with, um, with the judgment, uh, that's in uh, Core Bundle, tab 6, page 86. And you can see at the bottom of the page, paragraph 28, the judge sets out the, the questions that I'm interested in here, A and B. Question A is, would it have been reasonable or appropriate between 2003 and 2009 for a clinician to prescribe another ACE inhibitor instead of perindopril in all circumstances, except where the patient was allergic or intolerant of all alternative <coughs> ACE inhibitors? And question B, we don't need to worry too much about it, just saying, if not, in, in what circumstances would that have been unreasonable or inappropriate? And over the page, he expands on, on what's meant by that. Um, and if we just focus on paragraph 30, Roman 3, the judge makes the preliminary point that these issues, A and B, um, are really only relevant as a threshold issue for issue C, which is the mitigation question itself. And we agree with that. Because as the judge says, um, these prescribing doctors themselves are independent of the claimants. Um, so we're not <coughs> saying that prescribing doctors fail to mit mitigate their loss, they're not the claimants. Mm -hmm. The question of whether um, what a particular doctor thought or did was reasonable um, it is therefore not of direct interest <coughs> or significance for the case. Um, the relevance of it is to set up the argument that, that Mr. Saunders has just been explaining to you in relation to C which is that if we can show um, that there was another cheaper ACE inhibitor that doctors could have prescribed again, then we're able to argue that the claimants should have been at making at least some effort to encourage doctors to do the cheaper thing, prescribe the cheaper alternative. And you can see at the paragraph 31 um, that the judge understood the question uh, to that extent in the same way as we did. You can see in the second sentence there, um, he says that uh, the question was whether the doctor could instead, in, instead of perindopril, reasonably or appropriately have chosen to prescribe another ACE inhibitor. And the judge quite rightly notes that sometimes at trial, the, the claimants mischaracterize that question. And we say they continue to mischaracterize that question um, on this appeal. And then at the end of the, the page here, before we go over, you can see that the, the judge also um, picked us up. Um, he said that, um, uh, that um, sometimes we seem to be arguing that the questions depended purely on questions of clinical equivalence. And I just want to address what we say about that. Um, we say it depends what you mean by clinical equivalence. Because um, we certainly accept what he says in the next sentence over the page, which is that this question goes beyond whether ACE inhibitors all had class effects. Um, in other words, whether they all had the same effects, um, or even whether any two had the same effects. Because um, it includes, as he goes on to say, questions like whether it's appropriate to switch a patient 
um, if the patient refuses to consent, um, or whether it's appropriate to switch a patient who is frail um, from one medicine to another medicine if there's some concern that that act of switching them um, might cause some harm. So we accept all that, but that's part of the question. But the important point for our purposes is in the middle um, of this paragraph 31 on, on page 88, um, which is that the judge agreed with us that in order for this debate on question A to give an answer to our mitigation defense, the basis of a doctor's preference for perindopril had to be objectively rational. Those are the key words that I'll keep coming back to. The claimants needed to show, I mean, we had the burden of proof, but putting that to one side, the claimants needed to show that there was an objectively rational basis for a doctor to prefer um, to prescribe perindopril for a particular group of patients. So that's the question that the judge was answering. And, and we say that what he said about the question there was correct. <coughs> if we can then go on, and I'll just show you to orient ourselves his answer um, to that question, or the bit of the answer that, um, that I object to. That comes at page 141. And Mr. Saunders has already shown you um, this in outline, and, and he focused on the answer at, at Roman 1 in 230, because that's, that's the point that we won on. I'm obviously dealing with the points that we lost on. Um, and so that's from uh, Roman 3. Um, where he says that but for patients initiated for heart failure, you don't need to worry about heart failure, I'm not appealing on, on that. Then he goes on, or mates, there was no reason to choose another suitable ACE inhibitor instead of per perindopril prior to late uh, March 2005 because there was no cost advantage. Just pausing there, um, while our submissions at trial disagreed with the judge about that, we accept that that much about the cost differential is a finding of fact that was open to the judge, and so we're not challenging that. But in the next sentence, what he says is that for patients initiated from April 2005 onwards, if the clinician followed the respectable, respectable body of opinion that one could have greater confidence in the benefit of perindopril for these conditions, since it was supported by, um, better supported by evidence, then it would not have been reasonable for that doctor to prescribe an ACE inhibitor other than perindopril. <coughs> and so we, we do challenge that finding um, in relation to the prevention of MACE. We say that uh, applying the test that the judge laid out in paragraph 31 of the judgment that I showed you before, we say based on the unanimous expert evidence that I'm going to come to, there was no objectively rational basis for a doctor to prefer perindopril to ramipril, specifically to ramipril, for mace. So that's the submission that I'm going to be making to you this afternoon. And so what follows from that is that from the perspective of the NHS, if the NHS found that some doctors were following the body of opinion that the judge is referring to here, then, then that would have been a good reason for the NHS to make some effort to persuade those doctors that that body of opinion that they were following was objectively wrong had no objectively rational basis. And this would now be getting into to part C. Um, our submission would have been that by following that body of opinion, which the NHS knew had no objectively rational basis, these doctors were both wasting money that could have been spent on other treatments um, for other patients who needed them. So that's ground two. Then for ground three, I'm going to be taking these together because the points are fundamentally the same. It's Roman four that we need to look at. So for patients initiated post-stroke, the judge says that a clinician could reasonably regard the evidence supporting treatment with perindopril as significantly stronger than for ramipril. And so for someone who took that view, it would have been unreasonable to prescribe ramipril. And again, my submission to you today is going to be that that is just wrong. The unanimous expert evidence <laughs> was that there was no objectively rational basis to believe that perindopril had a stronger evidence base than, than ramipril. And while we're here, I should also just look at, at Roman 5, um, just because that's a point that's relied upon by the claimants in their skeleton argument. 
What the judge says there <coughs> is that if patients are initiated by a consultant in secondary care in a hospital, then it was unreasonable or inappropriate for a GP to switch that patient to another ACE inhibitor if the GP considered that the consultant had selected perindipril based on his or her more specialised experience and expertise. And, and we're not challenging that finding um, today. Um, what we say about that is that uh, the NHS should have been um, tackling that problem at source um, by persuading the consultants um, to, not to prescribe perindipril, but instead to prescribe um, ramipril. And of course, whether that much is right, so whether the NHS should have been doing that, that's a question C issue. And so that's not one that, that I'm going to be dealing with today. That, that will have to be an issue that's picked up um, again uh, at, at a later trial if we ever get there. Yeah. Um, and just before I leave here and go to the case that we put, um, I just want to note something about the nature of these conclusions that I've just been showing you that we're challenging. As you remember, when we were looking um, at paragraph 30 and paragraph 31 of the judgment, the judge made the fair point um, that the question A and question B go beyond a narrow view of what clinical means. And it extends to um, other issues like patient consent and the like. Um, and elsewhere, he makes the fair point that questions about dosing or questions about titration might be relevant too. But the point I want to make is this, that the findings that I am challenging today are not about those wider considerations. The, the findings that I've been highlighting here that I'm challenging today are about the evidence for the effectiveness of perindipril for treating these patients, stopping them from having major adverse cardiac events, stopping them from having strokes, stopping them from dying. That's what we're interested in. Because the, the, what the judge is saying in, in these sections is that a doctor could reasonably have concluded that the evidence for effectiveness um, was stronger for perindipril than for ramipril, and that's what we say is just wrong. Um, and so my point here is that that is a pure question um, about what the evidence showed um, about clinical pharmacology. Um, so that then takes us to our case, um, which as I've said, I'd like to show you from our, our written closings. Um, you can pick that up, it's in the supplemental bundle, it's at tab 21. And if we can pick it up from page 279. And I should just say that the reason I'm showing you our written closings on this um, is really just as a shorthand rather than having created bundles that create reams and reams of evidence. And so obviously you don't have to accept that everything we say here is, is correct. Um, but I do say that everything that we say here that is material should have been answered in the judgment. And so my submission really on this appeal is that there is just no answer um, to what we say here. So you can see that we've opened up to section D of our closings, um, which was addressing the pharmacological perspective. And I want to start with the point that we made about at paragraph 22, which was about the scope of clinical pharmacology and the scope of the expertise of the claimant's expert in clinical pharmacology, Dr. Coulson. You can see from the, the quotes that we've set out here, which are from my cross-examination of him, um, that clinical pharmacology extends, extends beyond narrow scientific questions about the properties of the drugs. It extends to questions of, of how to prescribe, and that includes the concept of evidence-based medicine, which we're going to come to. So, so we say that his expertise covered the whole field that, that I'm addressing you on today. Now, I acknowledge, and this is a point made by my learned friends of the claimants, that he was not put forward as an expert on the question of how GPs actually make their decisions in practice. There was a different expert for the claimants, Dr. Dwerden, who addressed that. And I also acknowledge that Dr. Dwerden's evidence on how GPs actually make their decisions was relevant to preliminary issue C, um, because you need to be thinking about what materials GPs can actually manage in practice and, and how they deal with the patient in front of them when you're thinking about what the NHS should have done, what efforts the NHS should have made yeah. to persuade them to do something differently. Um, but the, the point I'm making is that that's not what we're on here um, in my submissions to you and in my appeal today. 
the one I'm on is, is squarely one of clinical pharmacology in the sense described here in paragraph 22 of our, our written closings. And, and I, I should just also note here that the claimants say in their skeleton, we don't need to turn it up, but for your reference, it's paragraph 67. They say that Dr. Coulson could not give evidence as to prescribing in primary care. And I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that, but if they mean he could not give evidence as to how prescribing decisions or what evidence should affect prescribing decisions in primary care, um, then that's wrong. Um, they cite paragraph two um, of his reply report, um, and that's in the supplemental bundle uh, 11, um, and it's page 155. If we just turn that up. Sorry, I wasn't giving you 155 or the supplemental. Supplemental, supplemental 155. And what, what we see here, actually, I'd, I'd like to start at, at paragraph one. Um, you can see here that he was giving evidence around the middle of that paragraph concerning the evidence which was available over the period, the relevant period, as to the qualities of and differences, similarities between perindipril and other ACE inhibitors. But he goes on, and on preliminary issues A and B, in light of the availability of that evidence to inform clinicians' prescribing practices. In, in paragraph two, uh, and it's the third sentence, is the one that my learned friends rely on. He says what he was not doing or commenting on was how or the extent to which this body of scientific knowledge filtered through to primary care um, practitioners or other healthcare professionals in primary care. So he, he wasn't answering the question of whether GPs would actually have read the materials that he and I debated uh, over the course of the day or so, but he was answering the question of, of, of what evidence is, is relevant. And just at, at the risk of laboring the point, I just want to take it one moment more to explain why all this is significant. The significance is that one way in which I could have approached the cross-examination of Dr. Coulson was to show him the relevant studies and ask him, in your expert opinion, as a person who understands what studies really mean, um, did these studies, in your view, show that perindopril was superior to ramipril for these patients? But uh, as we'll see, that's, that's not the way I went about it. Uh, because he's an expert not only in the question of effectiveness or, or the properties of drugs, but also in the whole concept of evidence-based medicine and how prescribers should prescribe, I was able to ask him a wider question, which was, could any prescriber acting rationally and having regard to the materials to which they should have regard, could they, could they have concluded that perindopril was superior to ramipril for these conditions? So if, if we can just go back um, to uh, paragraph 22 of our written closings, which is on page 279 of the supplemental bundle. Um, Dr. Coulson also, um, well, we also summarized the evidence that, that Dr. Coulson gave on what material a prescriber should consider um, when deciding what to prescribe. It's about the, the middle of the, of the paragraph. Um, and what he said was that if a prescriber was not competent to understand the primary materials for themselves properly, that is, the studies, then they should defer to authoritative sources like the BNF and the NICE guidelines and the materials produced by the NPC and the cl clinical evidence publication um, in the BMJ. Um, indeed, we go on to say that the NPC, um, which was an NHS-linked organization, had said the same thing in a bulletin that was issued at the relevant time. So that's what I want to say about the scope of Dr. Coulson's um, expertise. Um, I also want to show you what he said um, in general terms about evidence-based medicine and what constitutes an objectively rational basis for choosing one drug over another. And for that, if we can go forward um, to page 288 in the bundle, <coughs> paragraph 56, which is dealing with a very important distinction um, in different types of clinical evidence. 
Um, and this is the distinction between evidence that relates to clinical outcomes in the sense of, did you have a stroke? Did you die? Um, or clinical evidence on pharmacological or mechanistic properties of drugs um, or mechanistic effects. And what he, what he was saying in the evidence that is summarized here um, is that evidence on pharmacological or mechanistic properties does not provide any basis for rational prescribing decisions. And that's because if what you're measuring um, or, or providing evidence on in a study, something like that, um, it might turn out to be a good thing for clinical outcomes or a bad thing. Um, it's not a one-way bet. And just a bit more on that, if we could go down to paragraph 59, you can see there's a, a quote here from Professor Masgray, who is another one of the claimant's <coughs> evidence, um, witnesses. Uh, he's from the NPC. He was explaining what evidence-based medicine means. He said that the evidence-based medicine movement started in the 90s. It is really quite an important facet of what was uh, of that, that what was required was evidence showing that patients live longer or better. We were no longer going to accept the opinion of expert doctors, and we were no longer going to accept evidence based on mechanisms of action and pathophysiological pr principles. If more people die, or the same number of people die only with a slightly better biochemical value, it is not of much value taking the medicine. What we need to measure is whether people live longer or better, not whether their biochemistry improves, for example. Um, and then in paragraph 60 and 61, um, we set out further materials from an NPC publication um, confirming that. And you can see, just casting your eye down, it, um, doctors were asked to consider if they're presented with information, whether the outcomes um, demonstrate that patients will live longer and, and better lives. And that's the question that they should be answering. And there are examples given in these materials produced by the NPC of something that might look like an improvement in a biochemical value, but it actually turns out to be not a good thing or positively a bad thing. Then at paragraph 61, you can see that when we put this to Dr. Coulson, he agreed with it completely um, including specifically in relation to treatments for coronary heart disease, which is what we're talking about here. And he said it would be quite dangerous, um, so not just um, ineffectual, but dangerous to make prescribing decisions based on what we call disease-oriented outcome data. Um, and the same goes for pharmacological properties of a, of a drug. That was not evidence that should be influencing practice. So that's where we got to on what constitutes an objectively rational approach to, um, to prescribing. I now want to move on to what our case was um, on the particular conditions that, that we're looking at. Um, and our case was, as I foreshadowed, that there was no objectively rational basis to prefer perindopril to ramipril for these conditions. Uh, and the reason that I'm picking on ramipril is that, uh, as you just saw when I showed you the judge's answers, he accepted that ramipril was cheaper um, as from 2005. Um, that and because ramipril was our strongest comparator for these purposes because it had a clear study in its favor um, in relation to these conditions, as I'm going to come on and show you. So with apologies for jumping around a bit, um, if we could go back uh, in the supplemental bundle in our written closings to page 281, I'll just pick it up from paragraph 27. Yeah. What, what we do here is we introduce the three studies that looked at the effects of ACE inhibitors um, on patients who are broadly at risk of, at elevated risk of cardiac events without being patients who are already in heart failure, which was a separate category, which we're not dealing with. And so those three studies were the HOPE study, which was a study about ramipril, the Europa study, which was a study about perindopril, and the PROGRESS study, which was a study about perindopril and um, another drug, which was a, a thiocyte type diuretic called endapamide. And those three studies had, just to give you the background, the uncontroversial background, um, those three studies had slightly different patient populations. So HOPE and Europa uh, both had patients that were, broadly speaking, um, at risk uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, 
and in the case of Hope, that, that included some who had had strokes. Progress was different because it was entirely made up of patients who had had strokes. Um, all three of them looked at the extent to which ACE inhibitors reduced the risk of a, a range of bad outcomes, if I just put it that way, like a cardiac arrest or death or stroke. Um, and they didn't just look at the, at the broad question of how likely are you to have at least one of these bad outcomes. They also looked specifically at whether it would reduce, for example, your likelihood of a stroke. Um, and as I say, an, another difference between the studies is that HOPE and Europa were both looking at one ACE inhibitor on its own, <coughs> Vamipril or Perindipril, whereas PROGRESS um, did look at Perindipril on its own, but also looked at a combination of Perindipril and, and Dapinol. Um, so then if I can just show you um, paragraph 28, um, where we know that HOPE um, was an unqualified success, and it found a 22% reduction in MACE. Um, and also a statistically significant reduction in stroke. Um, so that's the Ramipril one. Paragraph 30, we dealt with Europa, um, which had, uh, I should say that these quotes are from um, Dr. Coulson's evidence, had very similar results to Hope, um, actually slightly smaller rather than larger. Um, and then at paragraph 31, Dr. Coulson agreed with me that there was no suggestion in either of these papers that these effects were specific to perindipril. Then, paragraph 32, we deal with progress. Remember, this was the perindipril and endapamide one about stroke. This study was actually less successful than HOPE um, in that it, it did not find that perindipril on its own um, was effective at all. Um, and that's unlike HOPE, which had found that Ramipril on its own was effective. Um, but then paragraph 34, um, we acknowledge that progress did find that the combination of perindipril and endapamide was effective, um, but that was roughly the same sort of effect size as had been achieved by Ramipril on its own in HOPE. <coughs> And then at, at paragraph 36, we note that the actual authors of PROGRESS, which was a study that's relied on um, by others, uh, by the claimants, to show how special perindipril was, the authors of PROGRESS in the study itself actually argued that the reduction um, of stroke risk was a class effect, mean, meaning that you get it for, for all of the drugs. And of course, the reason they wanted to do that was because, um, I don't want to get into their, their mindset, but of course it, they needed to do that, whereas the Authors of Hope didn't, because the Authors of Hope actually had a success for their drug, whereas the Authors of Progress only had it for a combination of their drug with Indapamide. Um, and then paragraph 38, um, Dr. Coulson confirmed that there was no basis in Progress study to suggest that perindipril was superior to Ramipril um, for stroke reduction. Then if we can go on to paragraph 50, which is on page 286, um, you can see that um, here we were, we we're pulling all the threads together. Um, and uh, in the uh, third sentence, um, there was never any rational basis for a person to believe that perindipril was a better choice than ramipril or lisinopril. And again, we don't, we don't need to worry about lisinopril. I'm, I'm just running this appeal on the basis of Ramipro. But for this one, I, I would just like to show you the source material because a lot of friends don't like the way I put it, um, we put it in the skeleton. So if we can just look at that, it's in the supplemental bundle, tab 19. And it's page 90 in the transcript. 90? Yeah, so sorry, of, of the bundle, it's page 267. Yeah, in the... Yeah. But in the script, internal numbers, numbers it's, it's yeah. page 90. Um, and so this was after I just finished on the topic of hypertension. Um, just so you know, I, I dealt with the other, I dealt with MACE and strength <coughs> earlier in the cross-examination. And then I dealt with hypertension. And then I was pulling all the threads together here. Um, this is Dr. Coulson. This is Dr. Coulson, that's right. Um, and what I said, just stepping back and looking at all of the ground we've covered, 
pulling together all of the threads on efficacy. Read line two. Sorry? Read line two. Line two. Line um, two. Begin it. Yeah, so finishing on hypertension then, and just stepping back and looking at all of the ground that we've covered, pulling together all the threads on efficacy, can we agree that there was never any rational basis for a person to believe that perindopril was a better choice than ramipril or plasinopril? He says, that's correct, my lord. Um, I think one, one of the points that my learned friends um, wanted to make uh, was that this question was only asking about efficacy, and it wasn't asking about anything else that might be relevant, um, like, I suppose, convenience for, for dosing and titration and that sort of thing. Um, and that's fair enough, I accept that. But as I, that's why I pointed out at the start that this is an appeal that's about efficacy. So that's the basis on which we lost. The other point that they make is that it's actually a quote from me rather than a quote from Dr. Coulson. Um, but there's nothing in that. I mean, I put the proposition to him and he accepted it. So that was that. Um, so um, th that's where we left it. But there was never any rational basis for a person to believe that perindopril was a better choice than, than ramipril from an efficacy perspective. Um, so that was the case that we put to the judge. As I say, that, that's a case that was based on the claimant's own expert in clinical pharmacology, what he had to say. <coughs> and it wasn't just his personal opinion of the evidence base, which actually went further. He thought there was a, a complete class effect that included all of the ACE inhibitors. Um, but that, that, that's not what you need to grapple with today. The point is that it's a question about the full range of rational views that competent clinicians could have held at the time if they had been practicing evidence-based medicine as they should have been. So now um, what we need to do is look at what the judge said about all of this. Um, and so for that, if we can go back to the judgment, uh, so it's the core bundle, um, tab six, um, page 134. Paragraph 207. 207. So, it, it, again, in, in the penultimate sentence yeah. here, he says that, um, so we are under the heading of MACE, and the penultimate sentence, he says that until March 2005, there was no cost justification for choosing Ramapril instead of Perindopril. And as I've said, we're not challenging that. Then he goes on to say, but aside from cost, it is notable um, that there were prominent and respected cardiologists who considered that there were objective grounds to prefer perindopril. And pausing there, we say that that is a strange comment for the judge to have made, because Dr. Coulson had told us that it doesn't matter whether there were prominent and respected people who thought that there were objective grounds to prefer perindopril. And you saw from Professor Masquerade's evidence that this has been well understood since the 1990s. It's not like law, um, where you know, the fact that uh, the Supreme Court says something means we don't need to inquire into whether they say it for good reasons or bad. Um, the thing that matters from the perspective of, of the prescriber um, and from the perspective of the NHS in deciding whether to take action is whether there were, in fact, objective grounds, not subjective grounds, to prefer perindopril. And just from this sentence, it's a little bit unclear to me whether what the judge is saying is, well, respected people thought a thing, therefore that thing is likely to be true. That's one interpretation. Or whether what he's saying is respected people thought a thing, and so other doctors could just reasonably assume that that thing was true for that reason without inquiring further. We say that either approach is wrong. Both approaches just fail to grapple with our case on the evidence um, that I have just been showing you. But it gets worse, because if we look in, in the quote underneath um, paragraph 208, we can see the particular views, um, or at least one set of the particular views that he was relying on. These are the views of Professors Fox and Ferrari. And ju just bear in mind, that these are, are two professors that the claimants did not call to give evidence at trials. They were not relying on, on their evidence. Their evidence wasn't before um, the court. But you can see what's said here. It says that the, the evidence base um, for the clinical use of perindopril is extremely large. As we'll see in the other chapters, it has confirmed efficacy 
um, at every stage of the cardiovascular continuum. Um, uh, and then it goes on to say perindopril has been tested in more than 50,000 patients in international morbidity and mortality trials. And that's fair enough. That's the right type of evidence. Um, and of course, we, we don't dispute that there was evidence showing that perindopril works. But then they go on to say that, that this lies on a solid file of investigations into mode of action and mechanism. Then over the page, you can see this reference made to positive effects on endothelium and other target organs. Um, and they say that these studies place perindopril apart. But again, again, the problem with that is that's exactly the type of evidence that Dr. Coulson and Professor Mascre explained should not be used as a basis for prescribing decisions. It might be a basis to go forward and do more studies to see if you can find some difference in outcomes, but you don't make prescribing decisions on the basis that you can have some positive effect on endothelium. Because it's no good dying with a positive effect on endothelium. What matters is, are you alive or dead? Then we have paragraph 209. Um, the judge says rightly that our expert, Professor Brown, disagreed with um, what was said in this book. And in the last, the second last sentence, he notes that in our closings, um, we said that describe these and similar types of publications as effectively puff pieces. And then the judge says in, in the last sentence, he says, having looked through their chapter and briefly at the other contents of the book and at an article that Professor Ferrari had published in a peer review journal, he unreservedly rejects that derogatory characterization. And then in paragraph 210, he says that there may have been a mixture of views. In the middle, he says that if the question is whether between 2003 and 2009, those concerned with prescribing decisions could reasonably and appropriately have preferred perindopril to ramipril, then I would answer that also in the affirmative, given the opinion of some prominent and respected specialists and the presentation of the Europa study. And we say that that just won't do. It doesn't matter whether the judge is right that there were some prominent and respected um, specialists um, who believed that perindopril was better. What matters is whether there was an objectively rational basis um, for preferring perindopril. None of the guidelines that Dr. Coulson said should inform prescribing practices said that perindopril was better. Um, and as Dr. Coulson had explained to the court at great length in response to my detailed questions about primary evidence, including studies like Europa, um, that evidence offered no rational basis for preferring perindopril. Um, so the, the reasons why he reached that conclusion don't really matter for today's purposes. What matters is that the judge doesn't even acknowledge that. There's no reference here to what we've said in our closings about the cross-examination of Dr. Coulson, um, let alone any reasons for disagreeing with Dr. Coulson. So really, one way of looking at it is that when, when we refer to a respectable body of opinion, which is a phrase that Malena Friends pick up and it's used elsewhere in the judgment um, as well, whether, it's, whether that's a, a proper answer to issue A depends on what you mean by respectable. Um, we say in order to be a respectable body of opinion, it needs to have an objectively rational basis. If it's objectively irrational, um, then uh, we say it's, it, it's just not fair. <coughs> this isn't Eurovision. It's not, a, it's not a popularity contest where we just see how many people think it's a good idea. Um, it, there has, has to be a proper basis for it um, in the practice of, of medicine. Um, so the, the judge then makes another point at the end of this paragraph 210. Um, he says that we pleaded in our defense that other than in relation to hypertension, the totality of the evidence <laughs> base for perindopril was in general terms superior um, to that for the use of other ACE inhibitors. Um, and the judge adds to this that the GMC guidance, this is under the quote, says that doctors should provide effective treatments based on the best available evidence. Um, and so the argument seems to go, if the evidence for perindopril was superior, um, it follows that doctors could legitimately prefer perindopril. Um, and if I could just show you where, where that comes up in the defense. Um, so that's in the core bundle at tab 10, and it's page 287. And if we can look at E 
on this page. Um, what we say is that the totality of the evidence base for the use of is, is roughly in the middle. Um, so we, we deny uh, the allegation in relation to um, hypertension. Um, but then we say, in relation to the evidence base for the use of perindopril, um, and the second sentence of, of the relevant pleading, it's admitted that the totality of the evidence base for the use of perindopril was in general terms superior to that for the use of other ACE inhibitors, and that Serbia marketed Covacil on that basis. For the avoidance of doubt, however, Covacil was not marketed during the relevant uh, period on the basis of direct claims to superior, superiority over other ACE inhibitors as regards clinical outcomes. So there's two important observations about this. One is that it's not specifically about MACE or, or stroke. Um, and so this wasn't a particular pleading saying that Europa and PROGRESS, um, which are the studies on perindopal relevant to those conditions, was superior evidence to uh, the evidence from HOPE uh, in relation to Ramapril. The second point is that it's not a claim that we had better evidence as regards clinical outcomes. <coughs> Rather, what it's referring to is, is a large evidence base that looked at um, mechanisms of action and endothelium and, and that sort of thing. Um, but in any event, what, what the judge fails to deal with um, is the unanimous expert evidence in front of him. Um, that said that nobody should rely on this type of evidence for prescribing decisions, because for those you need to look at the clinical outcomes. So that's the picture for, for MACE. The picture for stroke is similar. If we could go back to the judgment, and it's page 136 of the bundle, paragraph 212. He says in the second sentence that many stroke specialists regarded progress as providing a sounder basis for perindopril than Hope did um, for Ramapril. And then he, he goes on to look at the evidence that was given by Dr. Smithard, who was a factual witness um, who was called by the claimants. And he gave evidence that, as a matter of fact, he personally thought that perindopril was superior. But as the judge rightly says, he also gave evidence that, as a matter of fact, he wasn't alone, and that other stroke consultants shared that same view. Um, to be fair, uh, the judge also says in the second half of this paragraph um, that Dr. Smithard also gave the reasons why he thought the print of was better. Um, essentially, he thought that the patient group in progress was more impressive, um, because it was wholly made up of stroke patients, and that included stroke patients of two different kinds. Whereas um, you might remember that the HOPE mm -hmm. study for Ramapril was a mix of patients, some of whom had stroke and some of whom didn't have stroke. Um, and then paragraph 213, um, the judge says that Dr. Smithard was not alone in these views. He refers to some local guidelines, um, which is not one of the, the national types of guidelines that Dr. Coulson had referred to. Um, these were the Manchester Stroke Guidelines that said that the best evidence for um, was for perindopril plus a thiazide-type diuretic. It's interesting that they didn't name the thiazide-type diuretic, even though there was only one particular one um, used in the study. Then at paragraph 214, the judge reported on what two particular stroke doctors near Bristol um, had said when they complained um, about the removal of perindopril from the formulary there. And then at paragraph 215, the judge records what our expert's reaction was to all of this which was to say that it was wrong. Manchester guidelines were wrong. Those two doctors were wrong. But the judge concludes that, that this, as in these views, appear to have been a widespread and considered view. He goes on, on well-supported <coughs> grounds among stroke specialists over the relevant period. But once again, we say that there are two different propositions that are embedded in that sentence. One is the proposition that there was a widespread view that perindopril was better. And we say that that's just irrelevant um, to question A. Um, we say that if there is a widespread view that is objectively wrong and costly, then the NHS should be investing resources to combat it. That's, the, that's what this whole mitigation defense is about. We wouldn't be here 
if everyone at the relevant time believed that, that all ACE inhibitors were equal. And the whole point here is that there, there were pockets throughout the country, I guess North Bristol is one place, where people thought the wrong things. And so the whole case is about whether what the NHS should have been doing about that. So that actually goes to make some, goes some way towards making our case on, on point C. Um, so the, the more specific, the, the more significant part of this sentence is the part that says that this view was held on well-supported grounds. And on that, again, I, we just say that the judge was wrong. I mean, Dr. Coulson was an expert in clinical pharmacology selected by the claimants to give evidence on this topic. I showed him the progress study. We talked about it at great length. At the end of it, he concluded that the progress study did not show um, better evidence for stroke for um, perindopril than for ramipril. Um, and, and the judge just doesn't deal with that. All he says is, well, some other people thought some other thing. Um, that just doesn't take them anywhere. He also refers to a quote at the end of this paragraph um, from our expert, which said that, that there was enormous debate as to whether progress actually was evidence for perindopril itself. Um, I'm not sure what the judge tried to take from that. I mean, that, that, that's, not a, that's not saying that there was enormous debate as to whether progress established that perindopril was superior to ramipril. Um, on the contrary, I think what this was is a reference to the fact that, remember, progress didn't actually show that perindopril worked on its own. It only showed that perindopril worked together with um, indapamide. Um, but it certainly doesn't say that there was a big debate about whether perindopril was better than ramipril. So on this topic as well, um, we say that the position is that the judge just had no basis for disagreeing with the unanimous expert evidence of Dr. Coulson and Professor Brown. What he should have found was that Dr. Smithard and the Manchester guidelines and the couple of doctors near Bristol were all wrong, objectively. Um, of course, that, that's not to say that any of those people were terrible doctors or anyone who followed them was a terrible doctor who should be criticized in a judgment. It's just to say that objectively, there was no rational basis for um, their view that perindopril was superior. And the relevance of making that finding was to set up the argument that we wanted to make at C, which is that the NHS should have tried to persuade these and other pockets of poor prescribing practices to make them more cost effective, but equally effective, equally clinically effective and safe approach of prescribing ramipril. So now I just want to deal with um, a couple of points that my learned friends make about this in their skeleton. Um, if we can pick that up, um, core bundle, tab three, page 63. Starting with paragraph 58, you can see they've very conveniently enumerated their points, so I'll, I'll just deal with them in turn. Um, the first point is that um, we're wrong to treat reasonableness as an issue on which the expert evidence um, should be determinative. Um, and they refer there to what the judge said about there being a respectable body of opinion. Um, that's in paragraph 58. But again, we say that, um, as I've already said to you, that misses the point. It depends what you mean by respectable. And in light of paragraph 31 of the court's judgment, respectable has to mean um, objectively rational. Um, based on evidence-based medicine, not just eminent or famous people um, who, who thought um, that a particular point was true. Moving on to their next point, that's paragraph 59. Um, they say that these issues that we're looking at are not limited to clinical benefit, but extend to practical factors like burden on switching and convenience of dosing. And I accept that, but uh, as I've already said to you, um, that's not what we're dealing with here, and that case wasn't rejected on that basis. Um, we're not challenging what the judge said about, about those topics. Um, then next point um, under uh, heading three over the page is that for these conditions, patients were usually initiated um, in secondary care um, by specialists. And the nub of the argument seems to be in the middle of paragraph 63, um, where they say that these proceedings only directly concern prescribing by GPs. Um, and they say that prescribing practices of hospital doctors are relevant only by way of context in that they influence GPs, and GPs may inherit patients from them from the hospital. 
But that's exactly why we say that they are relevant. Because our case was that if you had specialists prescribing perindopril for objectively irrational reasons, um, and if that was driving up um, follow-up prescriptions by GPs uh, after the patient left hospital, then the NHS should have taken steps to solve that problem at its source. Um, and I'll just give you a reference. I won't show you our written closings on it because it doesn't really matter. But in our written closings, that supplemental bundle, um, tab 21, page 325, we have a whole section headed Overcoming Obstacles, um, yeah. beginning paragraph 168. Sorry, what was the reference again? Yes, it's um, Supplemental Bundle, yeah. um, page 325. So you can see that there's a heading towards the bottom of the page, Overcoming Obstacles. And we say in paragraph 168 that if a PCT encountered an obstacle, like a consultant on a committee blocking a change, um, then they should have challenged them. And over the page, we have um, snippets from the evidence that we both that went to the trouble of eliciting um, of uh, PCTs doing exactly that. Take the first one, um, this is Watson from Plymouth. Um, she explained how they would seek in Plymouth PCT to influence hospital doctors. Um, then down at paragraph 170, we refer to an occasion on which Dr. Dwerden, who, as I said, was one of the claimants and other expert witnesses on prescribing practices, he'd actually used some centrally prepared materials that came from the NPC to persuade a stroke consultant, of all things, to stop using perindopril. Um, now, obviously, I I'm not asking you to conclude today that we're right at question C level, that this is something that the NHS had to do in order to be reasonable. Um, but the point is that if we'd got through the hurdles of questions A and B, then that would have then been the argument on issue C. It would have been up for grabs. It's not an answer to my point that, um, that, that we get there by trying to persuade consultants. Um, in fact, the, the mere fact that the people that we needed to persuade were a small group of consultants rather than a large group of, of GPs might be thought to be a point in our favour um, when we get to step C, because it's less work. Um, returning to their skeleton back in the core bundle um, at uh, page 65, we have the fourth point, which is uh, that we misrepresented the evidence of Dr. Coulson. Um, but those are the points that I've already picked up. You already dealt with that point. Um, and then the final point uh, is over the page, paragraph 70, um, where they say that grounds two and three are incapable of invalidating the order. Um, well, the order is at tab five. Um, that's the four bundle. Um, if you just go over the page to page 75, with the order, paragraph one, just gives judgment for the claimants. On these defences, and that's what we're appealing. Mm -hmm. And it's true that my grounds, I mean, Mr. Saunders told you at the outset, my, my grounds only have any traction if he wins um, yeah. on ground one. Um, it might also be relevant to costs, but, um, but in terms of making a difference to the outcome, we need to win on ground one. But if we do win on ground one, and then we also win on grounds two and three, then when we later come back to look at particular areas um, in, in the UK where um, action should have been taken, we say, it won't just be action about hypertension, it will also be action about um, a group of patients who are being treated prophylactically for the avoidance of MACE, or the group of patients who are being treated post-stroke. They'll be on the table as well for us to target. That's the whole point of my grounds two and three. Um, so we, we say that the, this point at paragraph 70 of their skeleton um, is a bad point as well. My lords, unless you have any questions. Um, no, thank you very much indeed. We will take a break in five minutes.
いですね。なるほど。That's true. I mean, when you look across some of the other changes as well. So it's probably walking past. I was looking at this one. Tempting to take over from my own friends. <laughs> <laughs> Hamlet without a prince. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Marginally under five minutes. <laughs> Possible the, what's going on in the court next door may have slowed some extra access to the toilet. I'm not, I'm not sure anything's going on anymore. <laughs> oh, is it? It's a, it's just as fan court says. I think the uh, re examination is due to finish. Soon after lunch. We were very disappointed that the members of the public who might have got bored of us in that case had never popped along here. Oh, I guess so they could have gone to the court. We could have get one free offer. <laughs> 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 right. Don't worry, Mr. Nice. <laughs> Call of Nature. Um, may right. please the court. Uh, may I begin with just a remark on representation? These are three damages claims for the four nations: um, the English, 
Scottish and Northern Irish together, and the Welsh. And in terms of representation, I and Mr Holmes are jointly instructed for all four nations. The juniors are instructed for the respective uh, nations. So Mr Drake and Mr Wolfe appear for England, Mr Gregory for the Scots and Northern Ireland, and Miss McAndrew for the Welsh. Yeah. My Lord, the main point in this appeal is Servier's contention that its defence, alleging a failure by the nation's health services to act reasonably to mitigate their loss, should not have been dismissed without what they call proper disclosure having been given. So I shall deal with that point first before moving on to grounds two and three, on which you've heard Mr Pitchnin, which only arise in the event that Servier succeeds on ground one. <clears throat> the gist of Servier's argument is captured in paragraph 49 of its appeal skeleton, if you have that to hand. Tab 2 of the core bundle, page 31. I'm reading from six lines down from the top. You see the sentence beginning, Servier contends. Servier contends that the judge was wrong as a matter of principle to find that Servier's alternative case that some PCT's health board should have taken some steps at some times could be rejected as insufficiently precise in circumstances where the whole point of this trial was that it should take place without proper disclosure, by which they mean what steps individual local entities had taken and the reasons why they had or had not been taken. So what you see is that there are three components. First, the proposition that Servier was running an alternative case to its main pleaded case at the trial. Second, the claim that the judge rejected this alternative case on the grounds that it was insufficiently precise. That was the gist. Third, the claim that he was wrong to reject it on that footing since the trial had been ordered to take place without Servier receiving disclosure of what steps individual trusts had taken in that period and the reasons why they had or hadn't been taken. The argument in a nutshell is that Servier was rendered unable to point to specific failings by individual entities which it could allege were in breach of the duty to take reasonable steps to mitigate loss from Servier's anti-competitive behaviour. So those are the three elements of that ground. Yeah. And our headline response, which with the court's permission I shall go on to develop, uh, is this. First, that Servier was not running an alternative case of this nature at the trial, as you will have surmised from some of the remarks you've already seen in the materials from the judge. The trial was ordered in January 2018, yep. following a discussion with Servier's counsel about the nature and content of the pleaded case on mitigation, which you have not yet seen. It was very clear that as their pleading sets out that Servier's case consists of two steps. And if we perhaps open the defence, which is at the end of core volume one, tab 10, and go to page 312, where the failure to mitigate defence begins, there are really two material paragraphs, 83A and 83B. 83B, step one, was their allegation that all ACE inhibitor drugs exert what they called a class effect. So there was no <coughs> clinical reason to choose between them in the relevant period. They were interchangeable. And other drugs, then available in generic form, were cheaper. It's 83B. That is the pleaded case. The second step in paragraph 83 
begins with the phrase, in these circumstances. It was the proposition that in those circumstances, the health services, which included each of the national and local bodies, should reasonably have taken a number of specified measures. Then seven are set out. The pleaded case was understood on all sides and confirmed by Servier to be categorical and comprehensive. And may I invite you to turn up Servier's skeleton in this appeal at tab two and look at paragraph 54 as one convenient point where this is said. Paragraph 54 on page 32 you will see that the first sentence said, its pleaded case, their own, was that all PCTs and health boards should have taken all the steps set out in the defence. Similarly, and I'll simply give you the reference, the judge records them saying this himself in the permission to appeal ruling in tab 7, page 87, at paragraph 11. That was the simple case advanced on the pleading, and the judge fashioned preliminary issues A and B based on the wording of Servier's response to an information request about their case and the issue of interchangeability. So you see the wording that he then adapted. If you pick up uh, core volume two, going into the last tab, tab 18, Page 588. The question posed, it's tab 8, eight the final tab. The question posed was at A, Roman 1, for them to clarify whether they accept that there were any circumstances in which it would not have been clinically appropriate to prescribe another ACE inhibitor instead of perindipril. The answer was, the defendants do not accept that there are any circumstances in which it would not have been clinically appropriate to prescribe another drug instead of perindipril, except when the patient was allergic to all alternative drugs. So essentially, it was testing that categorical case, which forms the basis of paragraph 83 of their defense, that uh, led the judge to write issues A and B in that manner. It is true that at the PTR in May 2021, when the evidence for the trial had now been lodged, Servier did suggest that it intended to argue that at least some, if not all, PCTs and health boards should have taken some steps, depending crucially on their local circumstances, so that it was no longer a generalized case about what all of the boards should have done based on the factors referred to in 83B. That was contested, and your lordships have seen that the judge ruled on that uh, in the PTR. He emphasized in his ruling, my lord, as you picked up, that it had been recognized, his word, in 2018, that the trial of the preliminary issues which looked at the issue of reasonableness on a general basis, could obviate the need for a hugely expensive disclosure exercise. Yeah, otherwise it was completely pointless. Yes. That was his thinking, wasn't it? That there wouldn't have to be... If, if the preliminary issue went against Servier, then there would not have to be an extensive disclosure exercise. Yes. Of any description. That's so right. If the preliminary issue had gone in their favour, then the position would be different, but that's often the way with the preliminary issues. Uh, my Lord, that's right. Uh, I, and I'll, I'll show you specific evidence that that yeah. was, in fact, absolutely <coughs> the case in, 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 a, in a few moments. Yeah. Uh, he, so just just yes. so I understand the context. I, I, we've been taken to the RFI. That informs not issue C, but um, issue A, doesn't it? Yes, A, A and B is really and B uh, is just a, an adjunct, adjunct right? yes. Um, that doesn't help us on whether or not, in terms of issue C, um, 
Servier was tied to saying that um, on some global basis, steps should have been taken, rather than uh, being able to say, well, a, a particular PCT should have taken these steps. My lord, that's, that, that's right. Uh, you have to go for that to the wording of 83C and how it was presented and understood uh, consistently over a period of years, uh, as reflected in Servier's skeleton argument, paragraph 54, uh, because Servier uh, made clear that its case was a categorical case, and you will see in a moment that all of the argument proceeded on that basis. And that obviously is a very important point. We can't get that from 83C itself, can we? Well, if we go to 83C and just have a, a, a look at it. So that's in tab 10, call volume 1. In those circumstances, 83B, the claimants should have taken all reasonable steps. They're then set out. And it's expressed as what all of the claimants should have done. If you go to 83D, pending full disclosure, they're unable to particularise the extent to which, not whether, but the extent to which each individual claimant took or failed to take one or more of the above steps. However, each of the claimants either failed to take the steps or, having taken them, failed to take any or any sufficient steps to ensure compliance with them. Now, it is true, point made uh, this morning, that by the time of this pleading, there had been a consolidation. Uh, but this was intended to mean, and certainly was understood and explained to mean, the claimants and the former claimants when it referred to each. And the reference to the extent to which was what they said that they could not particularise. So, so when we come to 83C, it's to be understood as meaning these particular claimants and their predecessors, which would include all the PCTs, should have taken all these steps. Yes, my lord. And that is what you'll see in the first sentence of paragraph 54 of their skeleton. They confirm and the judge gives another reference in the uh, permission to appeal ruling. I'm afraid I, can I pursue it a moment longer? Of course. I mean, you're, you're obviously not contending that it was crucial to the defence that all these various things should have been done. It would have been possible for uh, Servier to say, look, we've lost on B, C, D and E, but we were right about A, therefore we're all right. You, you couldn't have said uh, your defence depends on proving all of A to E. No, uh, my lord, that is right. Uh, so they could have had an outcome in which the judge went through each of those steps as he did, and said, well, I find that there was no generalised duty, there were no general standards, meaning that they should have done A, B and C. But there was a requirement, for example, that they should have removed perindopril from local formularies. Yes. And that I do find to be a clear standard. So on that one, I do find that their case succeeds. And I absolutely see the importance of finding out about the significance of clear standards. But just in terms of the pleading, they say this group of people should have done all these things. But obviously it's right that they could win on their defence if that group of people should have done one of those things rather than all of those things. But why isn't it also the case that in terms of the pleading, they could say, oh, OK, it isn't right that all these people should have done all these things, but this one person should have done all these things, or this person should have done one of these things. Well, uh, my lord... First, that wasn't the way that it was put, and that's the argument which you'll see occurred at various points before the trial was, trial was held, including in 2021. And part of the answer to your Lordship's question is that if you do approach it on that basis, then for the reason given by my Lord the Chancellor, you're facing an entirely different animal. And then the judge's basic decision about having gone ahead in this way uh, is is a different one, because the case that they're making is that it all depends on local circumstances and that they need the disclosure of what happened all across the country, the heat map described by my friend, 
in order to be able to say whether an individual entity or a collection of individual entities of some description have behaved unreasonably. And what you'll see in a moment, and I, I, sh I shall hope to demonstrate this, is that the, the, the argument was not presented in that way. And for good reason, the judge decided that if the trial went ahead on the basis that he conceived it, and were the health services to win, which we did, that would dispose of the mitigation defence. One would not then come back and say, but hold on, in some individual cases, which we will need disclosure of, unavoidably, uh, there may have been incompetence or failures. And so for that, we are, I'm afraid, all of that was a waste of time. We'll have to ask for all of that. Uh, it was precisely because that was not the way the case was put that he went ahead in this fashion. And your point on 83D is it says we need disclosure to, to find out to what extent each claimant has done this. We don't need disclosure to find out to what extent each claimant should have done this. That's right, because that because the, the duty is said to be a general... Yes, that's a absolutely... A3D right. is not directed at duty, but at breach. Yes. Yes, yeah. yes absolutely. Yeah. So, the judge then, in uh, the PTR ruling, as, as I say, he says it had been recognised in 2018 that if it's approached on this general basis, it could obviate the need for the disclosure exercise. And to follow what uh, I was saying in an argument with my Lord Lord Justice Newey, were it the case that the, the case was put in a different way, then that would not have been so. <coughs> Similarly, and I, I'll perhaps come to it, one of the paragraphs in that ruling that you um, did not look at was where the judge said, were they to run this case, I would expect there to be an amendment the pleaded case, but there was no amendment forthcoming. And that is that was really the essential uh, context. The point is, therefore, that Servier, Servier's proposed approach to the trial, which it came up with at the PTR, was inconsistent with what had gone before and what was the basis for his order. So, uh, in a nutshell, while it is correct that Servier chose not to pay heed to the judge's decision in what it then went on to say in its submissions at the trial, it is wrong for Servier, we say, to assert simply that it was running an alternative case. That's the first of the three <coughs> components that I will wish to develop briefly, but that's the gist. The second element is the proposition that the judge rejected the alternative case at the trial on the grounds that he found it insufficiently precise. And this too, we will say, is wrong. We shall turn to the key paragraphs in the judge's judgment at the end, 388 to 391, where he briefly addresses the arguments that were made by Servier at the end of the trial, which deviated from the pleaded case. And what you will see is that he is there mainly dealing, in the beginning of those paragraphs, with a specific new argument that all PCTs and health boards with higher rates of prescribing in some undefined manner of Servier's drug, that was the category where steps should have been taken to reduce the rate of prescribing, even if not every PCT in the land needed to do so. So that was the change that he first addresses in the early paragraph 388. He then picks up Servier's wider, more general contention towards the end of that little group of paragraphs, that it was necessary to investigate the local circumstances of individual PCTs and health boards for the purpose of the mitigation defence in paragraphs 390 and 391, the two paragraphs right at the end. And in our submission, it is crystal clear that he did not reject that contention simply because it was insufficiently precise. As well as the fact that this, too, was unpleaded, as well as the shift to saying it should be 
all bodies with a higher rate of prescribing that we are targeting. The judge rejected the contention by reference to three matters. First, the Kuwait Airways principle, yeah. that the legal test is what is the extent of the loss for which Servier ought fairly or reasonably or justly to be held liable, given the reasons why the law has recognised the cause of action here in competition law. And similar to the ordinary law of remoteness in tort, the essential point is that one is not only concerned with causal potency, one is concerned with a value judgment, the point that Lord Nichols made in that case, in deciding to what extent an entity raising a defence of failure to mitigate can uh, assert it and put the claimants to the trouble of <coughs> answering all of the allegations. It depends on the context, the circumstances of the individual claim. So it's really a point you picked up in the judgment of Mr. Lantis, actually. I mean, it's the same point. It is, Lantis, uh, well, actually. Uh, uh, it, it is. It is exactly, uh, yes. If, if you like, sort of a public policy point there, that you wouldn't, you don't, you don't, um, as it were, impose on the claimant a, 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 an unduly onerous duty in relation to mitigation if, if by doing so you, you effectively um, stymie the whole purpose of, of um, the relevant aspect of competition. Yes. You, you, one's sensitive to the nature of the cause of action yeah. and to pick up, uh, as I'll develop in a few minutes, the the authorities, the classic authorities, general authorities that were referred to by the judge in yeah. this section of his judgment, such as Banco de Banco Portugal, Portugal, Lord Macmillan, who don't weigh in nice scales what the claimant has done, um, picked up by Lord Justice Gross in a case called Borealis and yes. Mr Justice Leggett, as he then was, in Thai Airways, where he, where he says that one shows some tenderness towards the claimant in circumstances where its predicament has been brought about by the wrongdoing of yeah. the defendant. So that's the first of the matters. So the, the first is Kuwait Airways. Uh, the second is the findings of fact which he made at the trial, which included not only Servier's sustained efforts to persuade the clinicians throughout the land to persuade Perindip to prescribe perindopril rather than other drugs because of claimed advantages, which is contrary to its case in the litigation. And that, uh, I apprehend, is what Mr Saunders referred to as the marketing point. But it went beyond that, because there was also, as the judge pointed out, nationwide actions to forestall and frustrate the very initiatives by local entities, which it now urged should reasonably have been taken by them. And this is distinct from urging that one's drug has certain advantages. It involved adopting what they called themselves deflection strategies, negation strategies. And I lay particular stress on those findings because in the context of this case, they are trenchant and compelling. It does not lie in the mouth of a defendant, we say, which has acted to frustrate efforts these are findings on the facts by the health services to encourage the prescribing of other drugs to argue that the compensation which is due from your anti-competitive behaviour, its consequences, should be reduced because of a lack of effort by the health authorities to encourage the prescribing of other drugs. So that's the second important point mm -hmm. which you see in those paragraphs and we dwelt on that in Mr Saunders' opening to a degree. The third, although your Lordship is right, it's really an aspect of, of the other two, was the observations in Stellantis that the procedural and evidential rules governing the health service's right to compensation must not be permitted by the court to become too onerous. If the rules do allow a defendant in Servier's position to raise an assertion that there's inexcusable inaction, on the part of individual local entities throughout the four nations. And then on the back of that, to call for widespread disclosure of what they did, what they all did, and the reasons, which will include how they weighed up different priorities that they may have had in completely different areas, what pressures they faced, what budget, 
budgetary constraints they were under, what pressures from local consultants were exerted on them, and so forth, in order to see whether on an atomistic basis Servier can construct a case, a mitigation case, then this is exactly the sort of situation that is covered by Stellantis uh, as a matter of general principle. So, uh, my Lord, I will turn with that introduction to ground one. If I may, though, make two very short uh, initial remarks prompted by Mr. Saunders and Mr. Pitchnan's outline of the relevant background. Uh, the first relates to uh, something that Mr. Saunders said in introducing the case and the, the nature of the drug class concerned, uh, ACE inhibitors, which is that the common mechanism of all these drugs is essentially the same. Uh, it reduces blood pressure by uh, stopping the constriction of the, uh, the blood vessels. But while that was true as a common mechanism of action of drugs in this class, one of the major points at the trial itself on the issue of interchangeability, which then had a knock-on effect on the question of what was reasonable for the health authorities to do, concerned perceived clinical differences or possible differences between these drugs. And if I may give you just one initial reference before developing this in due course. If you have the judgment and go in it to page uh, 130, yeah. at the bottom of that page, right at the bottom, under the heading heart failure, but it's a general point, in an article entitled, Are All angiotensin converting inhibitors interchangeable by two authors published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2001. You see those authors cautioning against the assumption of a class effect. And I'll just take you to one part of that at this point. In the second paragraph down in the quote, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see five lines down, sentence beginning, moreover, Moreover, since all drugs have multiple mechanisms of action determined by their unique chemical structure, each ACE inhibitor probably has some not in common actions. When one considers the marked differences in chemical structure among the available ACE inhibitors, it's not surprising they might have different clinical actions. While the effects of the not in common actions may be unimportant, they could also enhance or diminish the overall health effects. And then the discussion continues. There are many pressures on the clinician to use or substitute a cheaper or formulary available ACE inhibitor or use a lower dose. It would be unfortunate if those pressures assuaged our conscience and allowed us to feel as if we were doing something good for our patients. Substituting an unproven alternative for proven treatment may deny benefit, subject the patient to unnecessary adverse effects, and despite a lower unit cost, may not be cost effective. And then you see in 196 um, reference to the international recognition of the authors and the quality of the article itself, which the defendant's expert uh, explained was a journal with a high impact factor. It's merely to introduce the fact that on the question of interchangeability and the basic allegation of there being interchangeability as a class effect, this was the, uh, the starting point. The second brief observation is a point of, again, what the case was. At an early point this morning, my Lord Lord Justice Nugy asked Mr. Saunders if the case included an allegation that the health authorities, the health services, should have taken action in relation to hospital consultants who espoused views about what was desirable, which they considered to be wrong, and not merely taking action in relation to primary care physicians <coughs> with guidance, encouragement, and incentives, and the like. Uh, the answer is no. That is not part of the case. In paragraph 83C of the pleading, you will see that all of those measures, and the entirety, the thrust of the case, was about guidance that should be given in primary care settings to, to doctors. The 
fact of what con local consultants did was a datum. It was an influence. It was something that the uh, health services have to contend with. But the way that the system in this country, at least, uh, works is that deference is given to frontline physicians by the health authorities who <coughs> neither order them nor can order them to, uh, to take a different approach. So that the case that was first mentioned by Mr. Saunders and then developed by Mr. Pitchnin, which is that there was, a, as it were, a breach of some duty of the NHS, he says in his skeleton, in some form or other, to persuade consultants in a specialism such as stroke to take a different view from the view that a group of them do have, mm. that is not part of the case that was pleaded or advanced at the trial. Now, my Lord, uh, I will develop the Four Nations response on the ground one more fully, and with the court's permission, I propose to organise the submissions as follows. First, in view of the debate that you've had today, I uh, wish first to clarify the litigation context in which the judge came to order <coughs> the trial of these preliminary issues mm -hmm. and to illuminate his reasons for doing so. Second, I will invite the court to look at parts of the key reasoning of the judge in the trial judgment again, which led to the decision to dismiss Servier's failure to mitigate case. And here I include not just the uh, so-called alternative case, which is the subject of this appeal, but more generally, the factors that he took into account. Yeah. And third, I will address Servier's specific <coughs> arguments in support of ground one, and I will explain why the appeal against the judge's order should be dismissed. Yeah. So, uh, may I begin with the agreed chronology, which is in tab four of the bundle. Beginning on the first page, page 68, you see that in April 2000, fourth entry down, there were um, the first primary care trusts, and that by April 2002, there were 303 of them. Also, um, 28 strategic health authorities, these are regional bodies that sit above the local ones, <coughs> They're established as well. You see that for April 2002 is the entry. Yep. Then fast forwarding, the English proceedings are commenced uh, lamentably 13 years ago, May 2011. Over the page, third of May 2011, halfway down. So that's the English nation. Then in July and September 2012, those are followed by the Scottish Northern Ireland and the Welsh NHS proceedings. Yeah. 1st of April 2013, near the foot of that page, the regional bodies, the SHAs, the local ones, the PCTs, are now abolished. They're replaced by new entities called clinical commissioning groups. There are, in fact, there were, because those have now changed as well, there were 211 of them. We go to page 70. November 2015, look to that page. So some three years after the original defence to the English NHS action, which was August 2012, Servier applies to amend its pleading to add the failure to mitigate defence. Top of page 71, May 2016, Servier files amended defences in the Welsh and the Scottish Northern Irish proceedings, now including the failure to mitigate defence. Those claimants consent to it. October 2016, <coughs> Mr Justice Henderson, as he then was, rules that as a matter of law, Servier's failure to mitigate the case isn't suitable for determination in favour of the claimants in England on a summary basis. And if I may pause here, there are two elements of Mr Justice Henderson's reasoning 
that I would wish to draw to the court's attention. The judgment is in the third authorities bundle, yeah. and you've looked at it very briefly so far, at tab 12. If you go in it, please, to page 678. And look at the foot of the page, paragraph 17, picking it up from the second sentence. He says, the English claimants uh, then make a number of points about the way in which the prescribing argument and the defences based on it are advanced. Servier now alleges in 83b that there was no clinical difference between perindipal and the other ACE inhibitors already available in generic form. And since the reimbursement prices were significantly less than the reimbursement price of perindopril, the only reasonable course was for the English to take all reasonable steps to encourage switching of perindopril to the prescription of the cheaper generic alternatives. And he comments, this contention appears difficult to reconcile with Servier's pleaded case hitherto and the considerable efforts made by Servier throughout the relevant period to promote the advantages of perindopril over other ACE inhibitors. The judge is therefore summarising the gist of Servier's proposed new plea uh, in paragraph 83b of the draft defence, and he notes that tension. But he goes on to say that the English claimants, re this is the top of the following page, realistically recognise that the resolution of factual disputes as to the actual perceived advantages of perindopril over other ACE inhibitors must go to trial and cannot be resolved summarily. We have now had that trial, uh, which has concerned the actual perceived advantages of perindopril, among other matters. But Mr Justice Henderson does not comment there as he might have done, on any implications of what he had just noted about Servier's conduct. That is, him referring to the considerable efforts it had made throughout the relevant period to promote the advantages of this one drug over the others for its failure to mitigate plea. And that too, that point, did become a major feature of the trial of the preliminary issues before Mr Justice Roth. So that's how it, that puzzlement at a judicial level first arose, but he didn't deal with it on a summary basis. The second element of the judgment to focus on is on page 694. Halfway down that page... In italics, the judge is considering the issue, is contributory negligence unavailable as a defence because the English claimants acted as Servier intended. He refers there, as you will see, to the judgment of Sir Donald Nichols in a case called Gran Gelato and Richcliffe, 1992, about five lines down, to the effect that about eight lines down, where it is, was intended by the defendant that the claimant should act in reliance on the accuracy of a false statement, it would need to be a very special case before carelessness by the representee would make it just and equitable to make any reduction to the damages payable. Now, Mr Justice Henderson reacts to that in paragraph 80 by saying he accepts that this passage can be read as providing some support to the English NHS submission, but it doesn't justify summary determination. And at the foot of that page, he says, finally, the question whether Servier had the requisite intention, which must mean to bring about the particular circumstances, yeah. of the health service buying its drug rather than others in the class, can't safely be answered 
before all the relevant evidence is in, has been considered at the trial. Yeah. And that evidence, the steps that were taken by Servier to promote its own drug as the one that the health services should reasonably prefer over others, was something gone into very thoroughly at the trial before Mr Justice Roth. There is indeed a section of Mr Justice Roth's judgment which is devoted to the promotion efforts of Servier to distinguish its drug as having special qualities from the others. That runs from paragraph 149 on page 117 of the core bundle all the way through to paragraph 168. So it's a, it, it's a significant part of the judgment. We'll come to it in a moment. But as we shall see, Servier was found on the facts to have devoted extensive efforts to differentiating perindopril from other ACE inhibitors, that being directly contrary to the premise of the failure to mitigate case, which is, of course, that the health services should have encouraged clinicians not to prescribe their product. If I now return to the chronology, uh, tab four, page 71, the next development after this uh, is important because matters um, heat up. Servier responds to the grant of permission by bringing a major application for disclosure against the English NHS in which it seeks all documents relating to any policy that they have had concerning the prescribing of ACE inhibitors over the seven-year period from 2003 to 2009. <coughs> and it's that which comes before the then-Chancellor, Sir Geoffrey Voss, in December 2016. Hmm. So two months after Mr Justice Henderson's judgment. Now, uh, my Lord, this is one of the documents that I've asked for permission to show you. Um, I, I thought this was already in the bundle. It, it wasn't. I'm afraid this one and one of the others were missing, and that's why I sought to put these two judgments in. This one isn't in the bundle. This is just somebody realising that it should have been in the bundle. I'm, af I'm, I, I'm afraid so. I've had my rant, Mr. <laughs> I'm sorry, my Lord. I've had my rant earlier no, in no, the No, no, I, 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 I'm extremely conscious. I don't, think you've, I don't think this falls into that category. I, I'm extremely conscious of the need to avoid a plethora of documents. That's fine. Okay. So, so th this is, um, if you've got that little bundle that was handed up, if you yeah. go to, it's big tab four, and behind it is a little tab 21, because the yeah. idea is it might go into the authorities bundle. Yeah. You'll see this is Sir Geoffrey Voss's judgment, 13th of December 2016. This is the point, in fact, when I enter this litigation. And the, uh, the Chancellor does not grant the grand application for disclosure. Um, if you turn to paragraph 8 on page 929, you see the position that the parties were taking. So Sir Geoffrey Voss says, when the parties appeared before me this morning, the defendant's position was that there should be a complete disclosure exercise which would throw up hundreds of thousands of documents from each of the various PCTs to inform the mitigation questions. The claimant's position, conversely, was that there should be a sample disclosure only of 12 PCTs, picking those PCTs with particularly high prescribing levels or particularly low prescribing levels in the hope the result would show that there was no correlation between the questions pleaded in 83C of the defence and the ultimate level of prescribing of perindopril. So somewhat ironically from where we now are, mm. we were saying there should be a sample and we were recommending that it could be concentrated on PCTs with particularly high or low rates of perindopril prescribing. The problem with that approach, as I put to counsel, for the claimants in the course of the argument is that ultimately it's unlikely that any particular PCT will be totally representative of what happens in another PCT where different events have occurred. And then he develops this to an extent, although language is not 
holy plea, you'll see in the first two sentences of paragraph 11, uh, second sentence particularly, samples may give certain information, but are perhaps unlikely to give the complete information that may be needed if this issue becomes important in the future. So this came at the then Chancellor very fast, but the point was that at this stage, he was expressing doubt that sampling would work because of the heterogeneity of these different local entities, each of them having different pressures, constraints, uh, local GP recalcitrants, local consultants, budgetary constraints, the lot. And so he was doubting whether the sample approach would therefore uh, be successful. Paragraph 23, um, this is where he's dealing with costs. Um, he says, I accept Mr. Council for Servier's submissions that an element of the cost are properly incurred and that she may yet be proved right about needing the documents from each of the PCTs. But it seems to me the approach adopted by the defendants was too bullheaded and they should have been more willing to consider different routes to the same objective, which they flatly rejected at every turn. So the point is here, you see the, uh, the battle lines between the parties, that one side has responded to Mr Justice Henderson's ruling by applying for this disclosure across the board. And it can do this despite the fact that the European case is proceeding, and as Mr Saunders rightly said, we can't get a final judgment on the liability until the European courts have reached a conclusion. But what we can do is deal with other aspects of the case, domestic aspects that do not depend on the decision in Europe. And the point here is that on the defendant's side, at this point, they are saying that this is an extremely important point. This is a big part of our case, and we need disclosure now. As a matter of case management, it is right for us to progress this, and we will want disclosure from all of the entities in England. So the Chancellor doesn't grant the application. He directs the English NHS to disclose documents which it's offered to search for. That's the, it was a sample of 11 of the former PCTs. And also to search for prescribing documents from centralised repositories. And then he directs that the party's disclosure experts people who are knowledgeable about how things can practically be done, should discuss between themselves ways in which the answers to the key questions raised by Servier's failure to mitigate case could proportionately be dealt with. So that was what the Chancellor did, and he directed the matter should come back in mid-2017 to the docketed judge, which was Mr Justice Roth. Yeah. So then you have, in mid-2017, a hearing before Mr Justice Roth, at which the parties were no further forward in agreeing a practical solution. I don't need to give you the details. Um, his judgment is the other judgment we've sought to add. So if you wish to see it, it's tab five of this new bundle. Uh, in it, at paragraph 16, he records expressly that Servier's primary position, if you have it, yeah. paragraph 16 on page uh, 936, <coughs> underlying the issue, he says, 15, as before the Chancellor in December, there's not been a cooperative approach on which this court can move forward. 16, underlying the issue is counsel for Servier's primary position to which she adhered, despite some questioning from the bench, that it will be necessary to determine what each of the 152 PCTs then in existence did over the relevant period. So throughout this period, the on the defendant's side, there's this relentless focus on complete disclosure, what everybody did and their reasons. As recorded then, going back to the chronology, the judge directs the economic experts, the economists, to meet in an effort to see if they can work out how there can be a sampling exercise. That then takes place over the next six months. The party's economic experts do not agree. 
and the matter comes back to Mr Justice Roth in January 2018. And although in Servier's skeleton for this appeal today, they say that they were advocating sample disclosure from just 29 additional PCTs, on top of the 11 for which we had already offered and given disclosure, uh, that is not correct. And to show you that, my Lord, I would wish you to look at the uh, English NHS's skeleton for this critical hearing when the preliminaries are ordered. And that is in the additional bundle at tab 2, behind little tab 22. And if you go in it to, uh, I think, external page 354, paragraph 9. <coughs> this paragraph beginning Ds were not satisfied. They now formally accept the principle of adopting a sampling approach. But under that label, they in fact propose an open-ended exercise that may still extend to giving disclosure from all or most PCTs because the order sought was that the claimant should carry out disclosure from a further former 29 PCTs, so you have 40 overall, but if at least six of them were not agreed or found to have offered sufficient financial incentives to move away from Perinterbrill, the process should be repeated in successive tranches of 29 until six have finally been found. Uh, even a sample of 40 is higher than the fallback position before the Chancellor, which they've adopted, which yeah. is that a total sample of 30 could be taken. So the position there was, in fact, our economist says that this is the approach that needs to be adopted, as it were, successive waves of 29 and 29 and 29, until eventually we have found six that meet a certain criteria. And that could easily have covered all or most of the uh, local entities. Now, there was a, a second point which then moved the judge to the decision that a way of cutting through this was to order a trial of these preliminaries who's on reasonableness. Because the health services also point out that the economists for each side are aiming to gather information, data, which will allow them in 2018 to assess retrospectively what had been the effectiveness of different forms of guidance which the local health services up and down England had employed in their efforts to promote cost-effective prescribing. So they would be looking at the data from the outside in and retrospectively. And as the court will see in a moment, Servier's argument was that you can work out from that from such an exercise, what with hindsight had proved, had proved to be the most effective policies. Mr Saunders took you this morning to an NAO report saying, here in South Dorset, this was effective. Here in, I can't remember the other one, it was, it was ineffective. But it's, it's, it's data analysts looking at what had happened and then infer from that that any local PCT which did not adopt those policies at the time, ex ante, had not behaved reasonably, given what was known at the time. And our position was, there's a break in the logic. This is, this is incorrect. And our position can be seen from paragraph 12, if you have the skeleton uh, in front of you, at 355, right-hand page, sub-issues of the prescribing argument, is the heading, uh, second sentence, for present purposes, it's believed to be common ground, the prescribing argument, which means you should have um, uh, encouraged people to prescribe yeah. other drugs, can be broken down into three sub-issues. And those were, and number one was reasonableness. Broadly, the first question concerns what steps, if any, it would have been unreasonable for PCTs not to take such that the damages potentially fall to be reduced. It's a mixed question of fact and law. The factual elements may require witness and expert evidence in due course. And it's believed to be common ground that the reasonableness question, addressing this, does not fall within the distinct expertise of the economic 
experts. Now, therefore, we are saying that inherent in Serbia's case of failure to mitigate, there's a, there's a threshold or prior question. It's reasonableness. And you'll see that we footnote in uh, footnote four, the Banco de Portugal case, and the classic judgment on that of Lord Macmillan about um, how one should look at the question of reasonable behaviour and not weighing it in nice scales. And this, the ex-ante question, is not something within the expertise of economists or statisticians. And then in the following paragraphs of the skeleton, the health services go on to point out factors which are potentially relevant to this question of reasonableness under the law of mitigation. And without labouring it, paragraph 17, you'll see on page 357, was uh, pointing out that there had been disclosure of documents showing the, uh, the marketing efforts of uh, Serbia on the one hand. Paragraph 18 referred to some material that had come is suggesting that Serbia itself specifically monitors the PCTs throughout the country as a very sophisticated drug company with a view to countering efforts by the health services to encourage prescribing of other drugs, what I've called the deflection or negation. And finally, and then we leave this document at paragraph 22 on page uh, 360, external numbering, internal page 14. As a matter of case management and what is proportional, the judge's attention was drawn to the high estimates of costs for giving disclosure in respect of these former PCTs. There's been amalgamation, dissolution, uh, recombining in different forms. The files are very difficult to retrieve and the costs estimate is given. And at paragraph 23, we make a, a supplemental final point, which is that now these entities, the clinical uh, commissioning groups, they are not part of the claimants. They're not under the claimant's control. And carrying out disclosure requests, 23.1, uh, requires their voluntary cooperation and is in effect a burden which distracts from the function of providing health care. Hmm. So I draw this to your attention because you now have a fuller picture of what the judge coming into the case management conference in January 2018 is faced with. And this is the context in which the trial judge canvasses with counsel for both parties at the CMC in January 2018 a solution of ordering a preliminary issue to be heard on the threshold issue of reasonableness. Uh, perhaps uh, subject to, I, I see it's, it's 4.15, but I, I'll continue just to make some general remarks, but then subject to your Lordship's wishes, I can either show you the bits of the transcript or leave that until tomorrow morning. Perhaps go on for a little bit longer, Mr. Turner, if that helps. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll continue for now. So um, the judge points out, as you'll see in a moment, that the relevant standard is, and this is accepted, what was generally accepted good practice for health authorities at the time. That's what one is testing on the issue of reasonableness. And that given the way Servier has put its case, he thought this could be investigated without the need to look in detail at what every local entity in England either did or did not do and its reasons. And indeed, he does comment that as a platform, Servier has already received full disclosure at that point on what all the local entities in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland uh, had done, as well as a sample of disclosure which we had given for England in respect of the PCTs there. The disclosure exercise, I, I should just remind the court, in respect of the other three nations was simpler because of the far smaller number of health authority bodies. Yeah. Uh, it's dealt with in the judgment, but there were 22 health boards in Wales, later reducing to seven, 14 in Scotland, and four area boards in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. 
So now we come to the, the transcript, and you can now see the judge's reasoning. And I regret, I, I'm not sure that there is a, a judgment setting out this reasoning. No. So the transcript is what we have. This is in the supplemental bundle at tab six. Now, if you go in this to page uh, 48, there are some bits that I'll read aloud. Others I'll ask the court just to read for yourselves, because it would otherwise be too laborious. Page 48, page 48 of the external numbering. Bottom left quartile, which is internal mm -hmm. page 8. <clears throat> and if you read now, uh, if we read down to page 9, uh, line 20, Mr Justice Roth, can we step back for a moment? This arises on your amended or re-amended defence. This is the disclosure. Um, yes. The argument that's been introduced about failure to mitigate or contributory negligence. Yes. That is premised on the basis, looking at your defence, that the alternative ACE inhibitors, the generic ones, there was no material clinical difference. And you explain that in the further information, no difference that would affect prescribing decisions. Council, yes, on the basis that in many guidance documents it was said the first line of under the following perindopril. Judge, that's disputed. Of course, it may not be a completely binary question. Um, they're completely inappropriate. There may be some patients for which it's appropriate and others for whom not. But if, say, in 20% of cases you could have prescribed a generic alternative and in 80% you could not clinically, that would hugely impact the financial effect of the defence, wouldn't it? Yes, I think we would dispute that on the numbers. I'm throwing out numbers, postulating. It may be 50%, maybe 80 the other way around. It would still have a big effect. That's not a question for the economists, is it? No. Secondly, assuming there's a proportion of all, as you say, patients who could have been switched, then there's a question of what a reasonable PCT, what policy it should have had at the time. Yes. At that time, yes. You say contributory negligence if they didn't, or failure to mitigate. It's not a question that what would have been the most effective policy. No. There may well have been some PCTs who had a very effective policy, but the fact that the others didn't does not mean they were negligent. Contributory negligence or failure to mitigate, because what they've done might have been reasonable. Yes. That question is also not a question for an economist, uh, is it? So you see that there he's distinguishing... The, um, the question of reasonableness in response to Servier's then exclusive focus on getting complete disclosure uh, uh, from all of the uh, entities. But if you go to page 49 over the page and you look at the bottom right quartile, which is page 14 internal, lines 12 to 18, judge... So you have the benefit of the Scottish disclosure and indeed the Welsh and Northern Ireland. Exactly. The problem I have with what the experts have ended up doing is they're looking at what is the most effective policy for a PCT to have. To do that, you need to look across the field. So again, he's distinguishing the question of ex-ante reasonableness from what was most effective. Then if you go to the following page, page 50, uh, you can pick it up at line 3. Uh, we do not know that, the judge, but that was also a prior question which certainly can be informed by looking at what the Scots have done, what the Welsh have done, what certain PCTs have done. But it's not actually an ex post question. It's what someone in charge of issuing guidance or formulary, or formula, yeah, formulary, or whoever it is in PCTs who deal with this, taking account of the information at the time, taking account of the NAO guidance and so on, should have done. Counsel, yes, with the caveat... It's a slight chicken and egg because of the point I made that once you have a certain amount of data, you can use it to judge interrupts. They would not have had the data. No. If you're pursuing a negligence case, say medical negligence, to stick to this field, you look at what reasonable doctors at the time would have done. You don't look at research five years later, which shows the effectiveness of an alternative, which a few doctors might have done. Um, then... Council says we're at slight cross-purposes, but continue, page 16, line 2. 
judge, you look at what a reasonable manager would have known at the time. You must do that by asking them. I can't imagine that anyone running a PCT would have had disclosure from every other of the 151 PCTs of what they were doing. Council, of course not. Or even of the sample. This would have been general knowledge at the time, general understanding in the healthcare industry, guidance and so forth, and all of that is uh, available. And then uh, to pick it up, bottom right quartile, page uh, 18 internally, uh, lines 7 onwards, Council for Servier, the way we envisaged it working is that once the economists have produced their reports on exactly what was effective, because of course there could be different gradations, it's not necessarily a binary question, once the economists have done their report on that, in the course of the trial, that would be informing the question of what was reasonable. So council is seeking to make a link and say that you, you can jump from one to the other, judge, but it would still be quite possible for the court to say, yes, this was clearly more effective, but given the knowledge people had at the time and the constraints they were under, the fact a new PCT went over and above what was reasonably required doesn't mean there's any failure to mitigate or contributory uh, negligence. Should that be a few PCTs? It should say a few PCTs, I'm sorry, yes. So then on the following page, 51 of the bundle, if you look at the bottom left quartile, which is internal page 20, um, after that debate, well, uh, I, I'm sorry, I perhaps, perhaps should, should start at uh, page 19, top left quartile, lines 20 to 22, the judge was saying that doing it his way, it will not generate disclosure from what I can see. It's basically expert evidence. It will not involve economists. So this is uh, resonating with something that my Lord the Chancellor said earlier at Mr Saunders' address, that the judge at that point is saying to himself, I can get experts in the medical field to say what was reasonable at the time, what was accepted good practice, and that's going to tell me whether there was a breach of these standards. It will tell us what the standards were. So he envisages, it's quite right, that um, this is essentially going to be about expert evidence of a non-economic kind. He then says on page 20, which is bottom left quartile, line 12, it seems to me there are at the top level, though you might drill it down, these two preliminary issues. One is, were there clinical differences between parindipal and the other ACE inhibitors that would have been material to the decision as to whether to encourage switching? If yes, in what proportion of prescriptions were affected? One might not do the second if that's difficult. <coughs> Secondly, was it unreasonable for the claimants or the PCTs over the relevant period to fail to take any of the various steps set out in the uh, defence? So Servier's counsel then goes on to press the point that Servier would want wide local disclosure in order to show what was generally accepted good practice at the time. But she says, well... We'll, we'll find that out from disclosure. And if we um, begin at uh, page 20, line 22 at the bottom, she says, just before I sit down and let the Health Services Council have a say, we're perplexed as how we can do the second of the exercises with only a very small data set in relation to the English PCTs, because we don't know without at least some more disclosure what the PCTs did know at the time because we don't know what anybody else was doing. The judge says at line six, your case is essentially a negligence case, isn't it? Contributory negligence, counsel corrects. Judge, if you bring a medical negligence case and you say this surgeon didn't carry out the procedure a reasonable surgeon of competence should have done, you would establish that by hearing evidence from an expert on what was good practice for surgeons at the time. You don't go and get disclosure from all the hospitals around the country as to what every other surgeon did. You rely on your expert as an independent expert helping the court, knowing what the situation was to inform the court. Counsel, yes. The idea that you would have to get disclosure of every other surgeon's operating practice would be dismissed out of hand if anyone suggested it. Um, so you, you see here, perhaps it would be uh, efficient for the court to read on in your own time, that the judge is identifying 
the point that the reasonable question doesn't depend on a particular PCT manager knowing what went on elsewhere. And he's, he's clearly contemplating that the threshold issue of reasonableness will be decided on a general basis. Yes. By reference to expert evidence and specific evidence. Yes. Without the need for uh, individual disclosure from the PCT officers. And he's also contemplating, it seems to me at least, that if that issue is decided against survey A, then that's an end of it. That's, that, that's right. And uh, he clarifies that in uh, a, a couple of minutes. Um, but this mean, point... Perhaps we ought to stop there, really. Yes, let's let, 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 let's let end there. Five, so I need to go. But I'm sorry but, to break. I had hoped we might be able to finish this particular part of your submissions, but I, I'm I'm almost at the end. But my love, I hope it, it it is helpful at least to explain yes. the reasoning process that led the judge to make this decision, given the submissions made on the other side. Very Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think we're. Um, I apprehend that we are. We have not slipped in terms of timing. So there's no need to sit early or anything of that kind. Uh, my Lord, uh, I hope and trust that I am going to finish in time. My friends have asked for an hour for reply. <coughs> I don't know whether all of that will be needed, but I'm going to try to... All right, we'll set half a centre on the morning then. Thank you. Thank you.